good to have everyone back again together this week. I'm going to invite you to stand together. And as uh, we do this, let's remember how great our God's love is for us. Sometimes for me, it can be hard to remember this, especially when people hurt me, have differences, don't have the same value. Um, and in that time, I like to turn to Colossians 3.12. It reads, you are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Our hearts and souls were cleansed and given free by Jesus dying for us. He gave us the ability to spread the good news and love others as God himself loves us. So as we sing God So Loved, let's remember this together. Come all you sinners, come find his 
darkness we were waiting with our hope with our light till from heaven you came and there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dark Praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings.
Jesus was despised and rejected by humanity. A man of sorrows, he was well acquainted with grief. Yet he himself bore our sickness and carried our pains. Let's read this together. He was pierced because of our rebellion and crushed because of our sin. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. We are healed by his wounds. See, there's very real consequences to our sin, to humans' rebellion against God. But as we've been singing in God's love for us, he sent his son Jesus to die, to take the consequences for our sin so that in his death we can have life and have a relationship with God. And so I think it's actually really important for us to confess our sins, um, to become more aware of Jesus and our need for him, and to become more aware of and to see more fully the gift that is God's grace and Jesus' death on the cross. So let's do that now. Let's confess our sins by praying this together. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Wash me of my guilt and cleanse me of my sin. I am aware of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. I'm truly sorry for my sin. I failed to love you above all else and I failed to love others as I love myself. Thank you for paying the price for my sin. Amen. Let's continue to sing with Drew that our debt is paid. It's paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Through the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. Now my day is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus filled. Now the curse of sin has no hold. So we live in this already, but not yet. Jesus came and he died for our sins by his death on the cross. But he is coming again to fully restore all things, to make us new, to free us from the bondage of sin and death forever. We're going to sing a new song. Uh, It's new to Veritas. We've done it on Sunday mornings here at the crossing, and we really love it. It's really a proclamation and assurance that freedom is coming, that Jesus 
one day will come back and make all things new and bring us to himself. So let's sing this together. There is a promised land waiting for me. Sometimes there's an ocean that lies in between. So I'll keep on traveling the path where you've been till I'm right where you want me. That's where I will be. for giving us freedom through Jesus. God, I just pray that we would walk in the freedom that you've given us, that we would walk towards you and leave our chains and our sin behind. And God, would you give us hope and courage to believe that for whatever chains still remain, you're coming back and you're gonna give us whole freedom someday. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We all want that, don't we? Yeah. To hashtag make it count. 
We want a life that counts for something. We want a life that stands out, that we get to look back and say, that mattered, right? We want to make the most of the one life that we have. We only have one shot, so we want to make it count. We're all trying to figure out how do I create a life that counts. So we ask ourselves questions like, who am I? You know, what defines me? Is it my success? Is it being seen, known, making a name for myself? Or is it my image? Is it how I look, how people see me if I'm admired, desired? Or is it my accomplishments? Is it my skills, my abilities? Is it being the best at what I do? We ask ourselves, who should I be with? Like, who should I surround myself with in life? Do I have friends? Do I have people that care about me? When am I going to find my person? When am I going to finally be in a relationship? If I am in a relationship, is that person the person, the one, or is there somebody else still out there? We ask ourselves, what's my purpose? Why am I here? Is it to just enjoy the time that I have, to do what makes me happy, to do what makes me feel good, to fill my life with experiences and adventure? Or is it to do good? Like, is it to leave the world a better place than we found it? Is it to make money, be wealthy, have enough money to buy the things that we want to buy in life, to always be secure and comfortable and have enough? All of these questions, all of this searching for answers, it's because we want to know what makes our life count. How do we know, though, you know? Like, how do we know if we're living for the right things, if, the, if everything that we're doing, if it's even going to matter in the end? How do we know if we are measuring up when it comes to living a life that counts? We've been in the book of Galatians the last couple of weeks, uh, and this is one of the letters that Paul wrote thousands of years ago to a church in a city called Galatia. And the people there, they're asking this same question. See, some of the people in the city, they've become Christians recently. And so after Jesus' death and his resurrection, now the church, it's trying to figure out what it looks like to follow Jesus, to live a life that lives out the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done faithfully. See, most of their lives, they have lived for themselves, these new Christians. But now they are convinced that Jesus gets to establish for them what life should look like. He gets to determine what their life counts for. So they're trying to figure all this out, but they're a little bit fuzzy on the details. And where we pick up tonight, they've recently made some questionable decisions. So Paul is writing to them just to help them figure out God's qualifications for a life that counts. We're going to be in chapter 5, where Paul is going to make it crystal clear to them what counts and what doesn't. So picking up in verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated, alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. If you've been with us the last couple weeks, some of what Paul just said, it, it might sound a little bit familiar. So what is happening in the church right now is that these members, these church members, have accepted Jesus as Christ, which means that they accept them as him as their, their savior, their Messiah, their king. That's the title that Christ is used for. So they've accepted all this, but they're, but they're being fooled into thinking that they need to adopt Jewish practices and customs and laws from the Old Testament in order to really be God's people. But Paul says that is insanity. 
That's crazy. That's like being free and then choosing to go back into slavery. The word yoke that we just saw there, it's not a word that we use very often anymore, except for like egg yolk, right? But the Galatians, they would have a mental picture immediately of what Paul was saying they were doing. A yoke, it's, it's a big piece of equipment that goes around the neck of two oxen or two horses that is, it allows them to pull a plow that tills the earth and gets it ready to grow crops. And look at these animals. They are enormous. Those are huge. And they have to be because plowing is extremely hard work. It is like being tied to a giant fork behind you that's pulling up roots and rocks along the way, and it is slow and it's toilsome. So Paul, he's comparing these Galatians and the fact that they're following Jesus' law, he's comparing that to the grueling work that these animals are doing. And he's saying to the Galatians, that's insanity. Jesus has set you free. Why would you put that burden back on yourselves by trying to follow Jewish law when you really don't have to? And it's not just that they don't have to. It's that when they try to, they are trading God's grace for the obligation, the requirement to fulfill, to uphold, obey the whole law perfectly. By going back to God's commands in Jewish practice, in Jewish customs, they're giving up the freedom that Christ has won them on the cross. They're giving it up. They're being alienated from Jesus. I think it's easy for us to think that following Jesus, it means following rules. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're thinking, yeah, that is exactly what religion is, and I am not interested in that. No, thank you. Honestly, I get that. That is not intriguing. That is not a life worth living, just following rules. But I think what we're seeing in here is that following Jesus is actually the opposite of following rules. See, following, perfectly obeying the Bible, it doesn't actually count for anything. See, it doesn't earn us God's grace. So back to our question. What counts according to God? So how do we make a life that counts in God's eyes? Well, Paul tells us in these next verses, picking up in five. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Righteousness is a big word for right standing with God. And so by what Jesus has done, he's set them free and he has paid the punishment for this, their sin. And so they are back in right relationship with God. And now they're eagerly waiting for the day when Jesus comes back and they will get to enjoy that relationship with him face to face. So for in Christ, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. If Paul is saying that this is the only thing that counts, then I think we want to be pretty clear on what that means. What is faith expressing itself, showing itself through love? Faith can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You know, words are like that, right? So different example, think of the word ball. Some of you, you immediately, you hear that word and you think basketball, soccer ball, some kind, of, some kind of sport equipment, right? But then maybe there's others that think of a dance. Some of you are thinking, no, it means you're having a great time at a party. It's a ball, right? Faith, it's kind of like that. It's a word that when people see it, when people think of it, different things come to mind. So maybe you look at this word and you think faith is belief. Faith is believing in what the Bible says. It's believing that what the Bible says is true. That's what faith is. Maybe some of you, though, you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, when I think of faith, the word trust comes to mind. Faith is trusting that Jesus loves me, that he's in control of my life. 
Or maybe others of you, though, you're thinking faith is obedience. Faith is obeying Jesus' commands. So if you're sitting here and you're thinking faith means believing, or you're thinking, no, faith means trusting, and you're like, no, faith is obeying, well, then I think I would tell you, yeah, I think you're right. Faith is belief. Faith is trust. Faith is obedience. Faith is all of those things because faith is a whole life thing. Another way we could say it is faith is allegiance. Allegiance to Jesus, who is the king over every part of our life. He's king over everything. The whole universe is his. Faith means living a life that believes Jesus is who he says he is. It, it's a life of trust in his promises for us. It's a life that obeys Jesus' commands because they're good for us. Faith is in all-out, whole-life allegiance or loyalty to Jesus our king. We got to pause here though, because there is one thing that faith is not. Faith isn't what merits our salvation. We don't earn salvation by our faith in Jesus. God's grace, that is the only reason that we are in right relationship with God. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, they say, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This is not what we have done. We didn't do it. It was a gift of God's grace. By grace, we have been saved. His grace, his grace is what freed us from death and the slavery of sin. It's what gave us new life in his family. It it doesn't earn, faith doesn't earn us anything. Faith is responding to Jesus' grace, God's grace for us by living for him. That's what we see in verse 10. So look at verse 10, the next verse. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We were created for loving him, for loving others, which God prepared before him. Before the beginning of time, God had planned this out, that we should walk in them, that we should walk in love for him and love for others. When we understand the gift of God's grace, our response should be faith that lives for Jesus, that follows him, that walks itself out in love for him and love for other people. Paul says to the Galatians that the only thing that counts is a faith that shows love. See, genuine, gospel-believing faith, it is faith that changes us from inside out. And it has to, because the more that we are understanding, if we are really understanding, grasping God's grace, then the natural response is going to be love. Remember, we didn't earn, we didn't deserve grace, right? There's nothing that we could have done or offered to earn God's love. But Jesus, when we were unlovable, he loved us. And that should give us compassion for other people. We should be able to see ourselves in other people because we are them. We are sinners. Just like them, we are sinners saved by grace. So even when people have genuinely like nothing to offer us, they feel pretty unlovable. It seems like they do not deserve our kindness. Jesus' love for us, it should motivate us to love them. If we really grasp God's grace, then the natural outpouring of our hearts will be love. So to put it even more bluntly, faith in Jesus, it doesn't actually exist without love. It is impossible to have a faith in Jesus that doesn't show love. That's what James means in his letter when he writes, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. It's dead. So faith that claims to love God but doesn't practically love other people, that is not faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus will always, always result in a growing love for others. It's going to be imperfect. It's 
going to be over time, but more and more, our faith in Jesus should produce love. So if we want to look at our own faith and we want to kind of assess what our faith in Jesus looks like, all we have to do is ask, look at whether it is producing love for other people. Is our faith in Jesus affecting the way that we treat people? The way that we talk, not just to them, but also about them? Is it changing the time that we take to care for other people? See, if our love for Jesus, if it's not producing love for other people, for our family, friends, co-workers, classmates, roommates, anybody, if it is not producing love, we have to ask, why not? Why not? It's a hard question, but I think it's a good one for us to be asking ourselves. The Galatians, they were living a life that counted. They had faith in Jesus that showed love. They really did, at least for a while. But then trouble started to creep in. So jumping back into the passage, Paul writes in verse 7, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. The people that are telling you to practice Jewish law, laws like circumcision, that is not of God. That's not his teaching. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that might be, will have to pay the penalty. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law, all of God's commands, is fulfilled. It's all summed up in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor, the people around you, as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you, Paul asks. See, I, I recently started watching the Netflix show Drive to Survive, which is a documentary series about Formula One racing. And I don't, I don't have, I have a feeling I'm not the target market for this particular show, but I love it. It's awesome. And the best part about this show is just how intense the races are. There are like a million and one things that can go wrong just over the course of a race. So you can have engine trouble randomly. Another car, car can just slightly bump into you. Your pit crew can take just a, a few too many seconds on the stop. Or you can blow out a tire. Or you can just take a wide turn and somebody can pass you just like that. You name it, it can happen. And all of that makes it super fun, but very stressful to watch because a driver can be doing great lap after lap, and then at the very end, they can lose everything. Something small gets in their way and throws them off course, and then they end up on the side with a smoking and battered car. The Galatians, they had been running a good race. They were living out allegiance, a, a full life of faith to Jesus, loyalty to him in all they did. And then something, someone cut in and knocked them off track. Working in college ministry over the years, I have seen just way too many examples in my life and my friends' lives and college students' lives of how this happens. So, I've seen when I'm growing, you know, people around me are growing. Things are going well in their faith. It's producing love, but then something comes along and it gets in the way. I think a classic example of this is school. So don't hear what I'm not saying. Classes, studying, they're important. Keep doing that. I am not pitting faith that shows love against school, okay? But I think things that get in the way. Things like homework and exams, projects, they take up more and more of our time so that we stop prioritizing things like being in a small group, spending time with those people, other believers. Or we start ignoring or avoiding people who need help. Or, or maybe we just never stop and pray for someone who's hurting. 
School is an example for sure. I think another example is friends. So again, friends are good. But if we are constantly hanging out with people who are complaining, who are talking about people behind their back, who make crude jokes, who treat people poorly, all of that, the more we're spending time with them, I don't think we should be surprised when our behavior starts to look more and more like that. In my own life, I have seen things like busyness, uh, my drive to accomplish things, impress people, succeed in what I do, all of that gets in, my, in the way of my love for other people. Quickly, it becomes more important for me to get satisfaction, uh, approval from people, and I start treating them based off of what they can provide me rather than just serving them humbly in love. So what is it for you? If and when you find yourself veering off course, if something is pulling you away, what's steering you from a faith that shows love? Is it school, friends, busyness? Is it those things? Maybe. Or maybe it's a dating relationship. Maybe it's your politics. Maybe it's the time that you spend on the weekends, where you spend that time. Maybe it's the money that you spend and how you spend it. Maybe it's the TV shows that you're watching or the people that you follow on social media. I, I could go on, but those things, they seem small and inconsequential at the time. They, think that they seem like things that we're just doing day in, day out, no big deal. But a little yeast, a little yeast works through the whole batch. That's what it says in this passage. Sooner or later, their influence in our life, it's gonna grow, it's gonna spread. So for me, I love my job, I really do. I love what I do, but when I see busyness turn into a need to impress people, then I watch my love for other people just shrivel, just kind of melt away. And at first, it's just in my head. You know, I'm a little bit less patient with people when they feel like a burden or an interruption in my day. But then it starts affecting my, my speech, my actions. Suddenly I'm rude, I'm sarcastic, my tone sounds super frustrated, or I make it clear to people that I'm just too busy for them. And suddenly I realize instead of loving people, what I'm doing is I'm tearing them down. The, word, the words that Paul uses for this in verse 15 are bite and devour. And the image that we're supposed to get here is of wild animals fighting, sinking their claws and their teeth into each other, tearing each other apart with the intent to kill. That's super intense, right? But that's what Paul is warning us against here. He's saying that faith in Jesus, it has to show love. Because when it doesn't, we are tempted to bite and devour each other. So it, it's small, right? It seems like, again, no big deal, but we do things like judge each other's social media posts. I can't believe she posted that. Ooh. We start to gossip about each other's situations, our friends' situations. Or maybe we drag someone's name through the mud just because we're angry at them and we don't really care who knows. We exclude people from our friend group just because they're kind of annoying, you know? We do all these things. We use sarcasm to belittle people. We're rude, we're mean. I'll stop, but you get the point. These things, they seem small. They seem like things that we do every day, but they tear each other. They tear us apart. They pull us away from what it's meant to live, what, it, what it's meant to live as Jesus' followers, this is what it's supposed to look like, Ephesians 4, 16. From him, Jesus, the whole body, or we could say the church, the community of believers, people living out faith together, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament. We're getting a metaphor here for the actual body. It grows and builds itself up in love, in love. Faith in Jesus, being part of the body of Christ, it means building each other up. 
It means treating people with the same care and compassion that we have, that we want for people to have for ourselves. Love your neighbor, love the people around you as yourself. And it means that we love people who don't know Jesus with a compassion that reflects God's love for, for us, and it invites us into that. It invites other people into that. This is what we're called to do, and we see that it is not optional. It is not optional. It's not like some people can do this, but I don't really need to because that's cool for other people, or I'll do this as long as it's easy. You know, like as long as people are lovable, I'm happy to love them. No. No, following Jesus means that this is a must. This is necessary. But here's the thing. I I don't want this to just become another set of rules for us. I'm not up here to tell you that now that you're free in Christ, you have to go love every person perfectly in every way, every day, every moment. That's not freeing. That's crushing, right? So how do we genuinely follow Jesus? How do we naturally live out this faith that shows love? Because love sounds awesome until we are dealing with real live people. And then it's hard and frustrating and exhausting. So how do we do this? Well, three quick three things. These are not the only three, but they're a place to start, right? First, ask the Holy Spirit to help you to do this. If you are someone who believes in Jesus, who follows Jesus with your life, then the Holy Spirit actually lives in you. It is wild, but he is guiding your thoughts and, and your actions and your words to give you things like patience and self-control and gentleness and kindness. More on that later next week, so come back. But my point here is that when it comes to loving people, ask the Holy Spirit for your help, for, for help, and, and he will give it to you. Second, read the Bible. And I know that that is a tough sell because it can be weird. It can be hard to understand. Reading the Bible takes time that we don't feel like we have. But personally, in my life, I am super prone to getting away from loving other people. And so again and again, I have to come back to the Bible. I have to come back to God's story of what he has done in my life, in all of our lives, and what it means for our lives, and, and re to find that truth for myself. So if you're thinking, I, don't, I would do that, but I don't know where to start. Personally, I love the Gospel of John. It's a great place to start. So my suggestion would be just read 10 minutes a day. That's it. And just keep track of how it is changing your love for God and your love for others. I think it will. Third, just start small. Like, try loving people in little moments. We have thousands of opportunities to love people each day. So think through, what is one way that I can spend some time, a little bit of time, go out of my way to serve someone else? Or how can I use my words to, instead of tearing people down, build them up? Or how could I spend just a small amount of money on someone else tomorrow, not me? Those things, doing small things, my guess is that over time, super imperfectly, but over time, that'll become more automatic, more natural, more enjoyable, honestly, to love people. As the music team comes back up, I just want to reiterate that this should feel like freedom. It, it is really freedom. It's going to be hard, but it should not feel like a burden. Jesus in his death and in his resurrection, he made us free. We have everything that we need. We lack nothing when we put our faith in him, which means that we are free, free to serve other people freely. We can do that. We can put others' needs before ours because we aren't gonna lose anything. We have nothing to lose. It's all there for us. We can do this. We can love with affection and warmth and costly forgiveness and patience because these are the things that Jesus has already given us. And the coolest part is that when we start living out a life of faith that loves other people, we are going to start to see people around us transform. 
God's love, Jesus' love, it's infectious. It draws people in. And we actually get to be a part of what God is doing. How cool is it that we get to be a part of what God is doing to change other people's lives, to bring more and more people into his amazing, eternal family. We get to participate in that. That's awesome. Faith in Jesus, living a life of faith that shows love, that is what counts. That's what counts. Paul says we're free. So if you and I are free because of what Jesus has done, let's go love like that is true. We are free. Jesus has given you life. Make it count. Amen.
Father, we thank you for the fact that uh, you have set us free. We thank you for the fact that you call us your children, that you have a desire to be in a relationship with us. And we thank you for the fact that you have called us to love each other and to be a light to uh, those around us, to people in our classes and in our families and in our community. And I ask that you would just help us to do that. Help us to take to heart the things that you've said to us and been speaking to us tonight through Alex. We pray all this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat>